like to introduce everybody to Virginia Clinton, who is now with Educational Foundations and Research, but who taught our intro to psych class last year with an OER. And I'm just going to shut up and hand it over to her. Um, yeah, oh, yeah. I have the wireless mic. Okay, and then I'm going to shut this one off. Virginia was our first big champion. Um, there were a few other people doing OERs. Virginia was the first one to really take it and run. All right, thank you. So like Stephanie said, I'm currently in the Department of Educational Foundations and Research, but for two years I was an instructor in the Department of Psychology, and my course that I taught every term, usually two lectures of, was Intro to Psych, so I had uh, anywhere from uh, 200 to over 400 Intro to Psych students a semester. And one thing I noticed, and that my students routinely complained about, was the cost of Intro to Psych textbooks. Let me tell you, when you teach 200 to 400 students, publishers come calling to you in droves. I would get uh, you know, six to eight publishing reps who would come to my office every semester and try to talk me into switching to their textbook. Um, I found one frustrating thing was is that they were all pretty expensive. Uh, there, there really didn't seem to be an economical option. And I'm not alone in that observation. If you look at the data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you can see that the price of textbooks, had, which is the orange line there, has far exceeded inflation. An anecdotal story to back this up, I taught at a community college once. My course cost about $500 to take. The textbook was $230. So my textbook increased the cost of taking the class by about 50%. Now I put it on reserve. I tried to find ways to save some money. But that can really be difficult. So why should you care? Well. You know, some people say, oh, yeah, I have a friend who has a college age son. She's like, what, so do you have more money for Spotify? What does this really matter? Well, it, it does matter because the financial, it adds to the financial burden of the college education. And there has been studies that show that as little as $300 can make the difference between a student graduating or not graduating. Now, $300 is rapidly becoming and oftentimes is becoming the cost of one textbook for one class. So as faculty, we can't really do much about the cost of tuition. We can't do much about our students' uh, economic backgrounds. But we can affect the cost of their required course materials. The other thing is, is we're taxpayers. And students, a lot of times, are paying for these textbooks out of student loans, which they oftentimes can't repay. And we're shouldering this burden. So we're paying for it. So this has led to the development of a number of open source or open access textbooks. Uh, these textbooks, you know, I can have somebody else go into the complexity of the funding model, but basically with a commercial textbook, the idea is that the author gets royalties based on sales. With an open source textbook, you have grant funding up front that pay the author and pay for things like a graphic designer and you know, web um, experts and people who develop things like test banks and things like that. So there is money involved in developing these. It's not some you know, angry person hammering out a poorly written manuscript that didn't ex get accepted anywhere and just throwing it on the web. Like, these are vetted and well developed. Uh, and peer reviewed. Um, if you want to go into OpenStack, you can actually read my review of one of the textbooks there. So there's a number of them. So why aren't faculty just all rushing out to buy these or to adopt these? Why are you know there's still the use of commercial textbooks? And this is not to say every commercial textbook is wrong or there's an open source textbook for every class. But generally speaking, what you see the holdups are uh, interviewing faculty is one, a need for more information. This is a new concept that publishing industry has been the way it's been for a long time. We're used to 
our textbook and uh, we don't understand necessarily this new model or, or know what the, if it's any good. And the other issue is, a big one, is concerns about quality. Obviously, we're, you know, we go into education because we care about students learning. We don't want to, you know, get them bargain educations that are going to be very low in quality. We want to make sure that the learning is effective. So that's where I love scholarship of teaching and learning research comes in. So we can look at empirical data. We can look at more than just anecdotes of, well, I use this textbook and it I don't know, my students didn't all drop out, they did okay on the test. But to see in a systematic way what the relationship is between textbook adoption. All right. So in general, what happens to grades? To sum up some of the research on this, uh, there's one study where the authors looked at a community college, they looked at a semester in which commercial textbooks were used, and then they compared grades in the next semester switching to an open source textbook. And they found that on the standardized departmental final exam, that the final exam rates were higher, that the number of students who dropped out, so the withdrawal rate was lower, and that there were higher overall grades with the adoption of an open source textbook. Uh, there's a, there was also a study that used something called propensity score matching, which is, uh, yeah, ideally in research, we can randomize people to condition. But in academia, we can't randomize students to classes. We can't tell them, okay, this is your intro psych class, and they're going to use an open source textbook, and then you're going to go this one. Students self select. But there is a way to match students based on key factors and compare their performance. And using that technique, propensity score matching, they found that generally speaking, in nine different classes, students did as good or better in terms of grades, uh, with the exception of business, which they annoyingly really didn't give an explanation for why that business class actually did worse with the open source textbook. And students were more likely to pass, so the the grades that were C minus and up were, there was a greater proportion. And pretty importantly, students were taking a higher credit load. A big concern with you know, getting students through their education in a timely manner is that they're taking the right amount of courses, or the most amount that they can really handle. Well, if students have these super expensive textbooks, the concern is, is they're gonna be taking fewer classes. But it did seem that Definitely, the uh, use of an open source textbook did help with uh, getting students to be able to take on more credits. All right, what about perceived quality, though? Well, first of all, I want to say that just you know, perceptions of quality, how much we like a textbook, does matter. Uh, in a study looking at faculty perceptions of quality, they found that it's not so much what textbook you adopt in this particular study, and this was actually a mathematics study, it was how much the faculty member liked that textbook that seemed to make a difference. So it wasn't the textbook itself, it was the faculty member's opinion of it, and you can extrapolate from that that they may be using it in different ways or in better ways if they like the textbook. So that matters. And generally speaking, faculty do seem to have positive opinions of open source textbooks and oftentimes say that they're of equal quality or better quality than commercial textbooks. So students' opinions of textbooks, that also matters because you know, we want students to actually read the book and they are more likely to read the book and use the book if they like the book or at least think that it's a reputable source of information. And in general, looking at the literature that's done so far, students are also likely to say that open source textbooks are rated as good or better than commercial textbooks. All right, so why did I do a study? We already know this. Well, first of all, replication are critical. Like I said before, we can't randomize students to classes, 
so we're not having the gold standard in research findings, the gold standard in data with these studies, which means you need to repeat them in order to tell if there's really a benefit or at least you know, a lack of harm with open source textbooks. Another area is uh, the measures looking at perceptions of textbooks and what students like about them are usually very global measures. Do you think this book is as good, worse, or better than your commercial textbook? It doesn't break down the more refined features to really give us a better sense of current quality. Another thing is, we're really lacking information on how students are accessing and using these textbooks. Great, they've got a free textbook. Are they actually reading it as much or more as a commercial textbook? Another issue is these textbooks are only free if they're accessed electronically. You can put something on the internet for relatively little cost for duplication. Printing and binding a textbook costs money. Uh, these textbooks are available in printed bound versions, but that costs $30 to $40. And you know, a student may be very likely to say, well, I'll just take a free version rather than a paper version, whereas commercial textbooks, <coughs> I'll show a little bit, at least for my class, you typically are buying the paper book or you're getting a used copy and it's paper. Uh, what does that have to do? And that concern is legitimate because there are findings uh, that show that maybe learning from electronic sources isn't necessarily as good as crank sources. Oops. Okay. So, my research questions. First of all, how was student learning comparing semesters where I used a commercial textbook versus using an open source textbook? What were the students' attitudes towards those textbooks? Yeah, but in this case, I'm using more fine grain measures of different components of the book. But another uh, addition that the study provides is that I'm comparing students saying one semester how much they like the book with another semester how much they like the book, not looking at here's your open source textbook, how do you think it rates to your other textbooks, which are probably other disciplines. So this is more of an apples to apples approach where other research did more of an apples to oranges. You know, how does your math textbook compare to your business textbook? Um, um, how are students using that textbook? You know, are, they using you know, are they using it electronically? And if so, does that lead to less use? Are students not reading it? Are they not using it as much as they did in paper textbook? And then, what are the difference in costs? Uh, a lot of times we're very much assuming what the costs are, and we can make very safe assumptions based on the cost of the textbook and enrollment, but that should be confirmed because students are pretty savvy to ways of getting around buying a textbook or paying full price for a textbook. So what are their reported costs? All right, so my participants, as spring 2016, I was teaching two lectures of intro to psych, and uh, spring enrollment's a little bit lower, so each of them had a little over 150 students. Uh, fall 2016, I switched over to an open source textbook. I used the open stats one, which is through Rice University. And I had one lecture. Uh, enrollment's a little higher in the fall, so that one lecture had over 200 students. Uh, commercial price for, the, or you know, sticker price, so to speak, for that textbook was about $200. Whereas the open source one could be downloaded for free. Uh, you can get an iBooks for five dollars or a bound copy for about forty. And you can print out the um, open, source open source textbook with your own paper and ink. All right. All right. So, so student learning, looking at overall course grades. Chris is like, oh great, look, I actually did better with the open source textbook. Yay. Oh, but I didn't randomly assign, and I should look at prior performance and credit to the. Uh, Office of Instructional Research, those students also have higher high school GPAs. So, ah, it's not as exciting as I thought it was. Moment of humility as a researcher, always double check your data before you get excited. But when you factor in high school GPA, there probably is no effect. You can see those bars and you can tell that they're about the same. Because uh, this is course level 
did, I can't properly put very it out because it was too far step savvy, but you can assume that this, the effect was all white. Uh, uh, however, it's about the same. The same. Yeah, the, the, the student's grades in the two courses is about equivalent, even though the textbook that was used was uh, free. And should note that as far as what do they need the textbook for, um, I gave uh, uh, quizzes and I had exams where there was content that was only from the book. It was not covered in the book. So they did actually need to use the book. What I did find, was, which was a substantial finding and far beyond any difference in uh, high school GPA, was that the percentage of students who withdrew was much higher in the semester with the open source, with the traditional expensive textbook as opposed to the open source textbook. Uh, this is consistent with previous findings. Yeah, unfortunately, these are the students who withdrew, so they weren't in my class at the end, so I didn't know, I wasn't able to ask them, hey, did the textbook have anything to do with this the decision you had to withdraw? I think this would be a good area for research to try to follow up to see if this would happen again. Uh, oh, and I should add that those high school GPA stats I showed before, those were only students who finished the term. Those were not the students who withdrew. But, but using some common sense, you could think that that student, if they didn't buy the textbook and are taking the class and waiting to see, do I really need the book before? spend this money, and then they find that they're behind, or they find themselves behind, and they need to spend a lot of money for textbook. They may be more likely to choose to withdraw if they have to fork over a significant amount of cash for that textbook, as to be able to just freely access it to catch up on the course content. And that's my speculation, which is not at all tested, but considering this is a finding that's uh, consistent in the literature, that the withdrawal seems it's definitely something worth looking into. Right. As far as student attitudes, I gave students questionnaires about midway through the semester. Uh, I asked them how much they liked to the textbook, how did they access the textbook, and how, how did they use the textbook. And I based the items on the features, on shared features of both textbooks. So, comparing apples to apples. Um, as far as use, those items were based on what I, as the instructor, recommended that they use the textbook for. And I do want to note that the responses were identifiable, but students seem to be very open to sharing pros and cons, even though their name was on it, uh, in order to give a bonus point. At that point, with my fault for its knowledge, I didn't know how to separate the identifiable piece out, but no matter, uh, response rate was really high, actually. Students really liked to share their opinions about their textbooks, actually. Quote. They had a lot to say. So as far as quality or you know, how much they liked them, I looked at visual appeal. How much did you like you know, on a electric scale, the diagrams and tables, photographs and illustrations, um, questions to test your understanding, chapter summaries, the way it's written, and everyday real world. And generally speaking, you can see that students rated on a Likert scale of one to six, they rated the textbooks similarly. Uh, there was a significant difference with how much they liked the way it was written, that where the open source textbook was rated a little bit higher than the commercial textbook, traditional textbook. Um, that finding actually, I just found out of a research study that's similar, they, they got a similar finding with uh, with the same books. So, uh, that seems to be a valid difference, although it's not huge, so the effect size is pretty small. There's also a trend, or not quite significant, not quite reliable difference in visual appeal, where students say that they found the traditional Source, uh, which makes sense because they put a lot more money into graphics and design and flash and all that with the commercial textbooks. 
Uh, that said, you look, at, you look at what factors actually relate to students' use and performance from textbooks. Writing matters, but visual appeal doesn't for me. I also ask them an open-ended item, what do you like about your textbook? And I found that uh, students rated the cost of the open textbook as the most popular feature of what they liked, which is not surprising. Um, and then they did say the writing was fairly popular for what they liked about the commercial textbook, but I think that's because you know they didn't have cost to include there. So if I can see writing quality was number two after cost. So many students here had cost that there just was weren't a whole lot of options left. I think that just was such a salient feature for them. But a lot of people would say things like, "I found you know the textbook is a good way to catch up when I miss class, or as far as their information, it's a good way to prepare for the exam." Those were the kinds of items that they had, and in that way, I think. I think if I would have given more of a Likert scale comparison, it would have been, would have been similar. All right, some, All right, some examples. Uh, students wrote that they liked the fact that the open source textbook had test questions at the end of every chapter, vocab words. Vocab words. It's kind of interesting to see what students noted as helpful. They can print it out and have access, as well as electronic access. Some students who did get a paper copy noted that benefit. Um, some students noted the electronic features. So you can just say Control F and find things. And that I was able to print it out for this money, and then that it was free. That was a very common response for the open source. Sure. Sure. The students who printed it out. You know, it's funny. Um, you know, so I didn't notice students carrying paper copies around, but I um, I had used and adopted a loose leaf version of the commercial text, thinking I'd save the students some money. And so many students complained about that. Not only in this, but in my course emails. I hate the loose leaf. Yeah, but I had a white binder. <laughs> A more legitimate complaint was the pages tore out of the binder, and I'm like, well, that would drive me nuts, too, if you, if you turn the page and pull out. So who wants to put the reinforcement for this in every single one? Uh, as far as what they didn't like, I found that a lot of students complained that they didn't like the electronic nature of the open source textbook. But they also complained a lot, the most common complaint was aspects of the print textbook, either that it was loose leaf or you know, some quality of it being loose leaf, or the size and weight of it, and just that it was heavy and bulky, and you know, it, it was they couldn't carry it around because it weighed too much. And that is true. That textbook is gigantic. It's like three semesters of material, which is pretty common with the intro textbooks. I did want to share some of these comments I got about the traditional textbook. Too expensive, teachers should tell them about the online PDF. The online PDF is an illegal pirated copy. <laughs> like, uh, no. Um, uh, textbook does not provide enough examples. It's okay, it's something special. This quote I love. It's really quite unfortunate as professors support this form of corruption and more review that's tied into the education system. This is what I mean by students really did not, no, no, don't hold back. Tell me how you really feel. Uh, why do we need to change the format in the textbook every semester and update the version of it? Well, that's how the education business steals an extra $150 from some poor college student who's literally living in the room the size of a closet, eating tuna cans every night, holding tuna in the can, not the can itself. Holding students' grades hostage until they pay up is brilliant. Whoa. <laughs> All right, <laughs> so I asked students how they access the textbook. Uh, 
Um, maybe about 8% indicated they didn't get a copy of the textbook. That's a little lower than other uh, empirical <coughs> findings. And it could be that people who didn't buy the textbook didn't bother to fill out the textbook survey. Um, very few got it electronically. Overwhelming people accessed it electronically. And that electronic for the traditional textbook includes people who said they downloaded a pirated PDF. So as far as what they use the textbook for, I'm reading four lectures. These are all things I requested that they do during class. You can see that as far as using the textbook, it didn't really seem to matter. I mean, they were reading it just as much or as little, good, depending on your perspective. Um, and using it for suggested exam preparation, just as much if it was the you know, open source or traditional. And then you can also assume that you know if there's electronic or paper. All right, and finally, cost. I asked them, how much did you spend? Because you know, you know, there could be some costs involved with that open source textbook. You know, and I even put in suggestions like, uh, guess how much you spend on paper and ink if you printed it out? Did you order a copy somewhere? Um, with the traditional textbook, on average, students reported spending $80. And that included the people who spent zero because they didn't get the textbook. Yes? You, um mentioned, I think, tell me if I'm wrong, though, that um, you allow people to use old editions? I did. So I then did. You're, probably, you're, maybe that's one of the reasons that some of your traditional the textbook students were the rate of being able to get the textbook was higher. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. There's a few people that, you know, there are some profs who do that, but there are also some who go with the new edition all the time. And prefer to have the consistency of, if I tell the students it's on page 82, it's on page 82. Right, right. And I, to, I tell students if you want to buy the 10th edition, it you know, has generally the same content. I looked it over. You're not going to be missing out on anything. Um, I said that the page numbers are going to be different. And you know, I've, I've, there's going to be, you're going to have to do a little more work, basically. But if you wanted to save $100 and do a little more light work, a lot of students also reported sharing the textbook, which wasn't something I explicitly said, but they said that they shared it. Uh, one student said that she shared an electronic copy with two other students, which actually is pretty smart. <laughs> but then some of the rates I had seen before, just as you were mentioning, the 8% is low. I've seen up to about 12 to 15% of students sometimes just not buying <coughs> the textbook and hoping they get through on whatever they find on Google. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's something I did ask students who didn't get the textbook, well, how do you answer the quiz and exam questions that are from content on the textbook now? Well, I Google them. Well, it's not necessarily the best source of information. All right, so I see my time's almost up, and I want to give some time for questions. So I wanted to acknowledge my research assistants who uh, not only helped me with you know some of the instrument design and data collection, but also gave me some undergraduate insight about questions I should ask as far as the questions on the questionnaire. And I also just want to mention a friend of mine, Brandon Wild, and his colleague, Gary Ulrich, uh, what they did, because they didn't like the textbook that was out for aviation safety, is they just wrote their own and published it. And it's actually become quite popular. It's gotten thousands and thousands of downloads, and they don't have those those students. So. All right, uh, questions. Let's see where's the microphone. Um, where's the uh, oh, it's winding up. Anybody have any questions for Virginia? Just that you would repeat um, 
kind of the experiment of asking the students. I've actually reached out to some students. colleagues because I found, I came across an incidental finding, which was I asked my students, how do you prefer to read? And I thought this would be important individual difference to look at. Maybe students who said they'd like to read electronically would do better with the open source. Um, but what I found is that there was a big difference in the two semesters, which was not something I anticipated. And there's this um, idea that um, the more familiar you are with a medium, the more you're going to like it, because we tend to like things that we're used to. People don't like change, just generally speaking. Um, and I'm wondering if having that textbook book actually was a factor in the reading preferences. So having that electronic textbook, did that change their minds? So I want to want to look into that more. And I see what you did before and after. Definitely. Oh, so this is not sufficient yeah, to address yeah. that question. Because I mean, this also could just be confusion about the question, right? Right. Like I said, well, I right. preferred to read the open source one electronically because it was electronic. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, so they might they might have been just been thinking about that. One thing I was wondering about uh, was I found it interesting that they preferred the, the visual kind of stuff in the traditional textbook, and I, mm -hmm. but I was wondering if that might be actually because of the difference in medium, right? So like, it could be. visuals are gonna, gonna be more effective if they're laid out differently on the screen mm -hmm. versus on the page. It well. might pop out more when you're yeah. paging through a book, you catch all the flashy yeah. colors as opposed to searching through a, a document. I mean, also just, you know, even just looking at the covers, you can tell the cover to the commercial textbook has more visual characteristics and versus just the name of the textbook. Right? about publishing companies having a lot of supplemental um, things that faculty use. Do you have a sense for you know, what the state is in terms of OER? Are people developing those kinds of supplemental materials, that kind of thing? Yeah, I actually forwarded an email to Lori where uh, I think it was Macmillan or one of the big publishers emailed me saying, hey, we noticed you're using an open educational resource. Would you like to use our supplementary add-on that goes with that textbook? And it, that's, uh, I think publishing companies are becoming aware that their medium of, we're gonna have these really expensive paper textbooks that students have to buy a new one every year or two because we change the edition so frequently that that's not gonna work and that their um, best chance for a new market is to go into supplemental resources with that. So I don't know what all they could do because the open source textbook has video links right in it and there are practice questions in it. I mean, they could make it more of a uh, easier interface to work with, where you could actually assign things directly and, and have it tied to grades. But, just yeah. to know about the supplemental resources before we move forward, is they, that is one of the ways that publishers are still really trying to get people to use their stuff by marketing all the additional materials and then, um, you know, that also ends up cutting the library out so a student can't go find an old edition in the library or something because then they go and tell you, well, you have to have this individual password and code. And when I've been arguing with publishers for like seven years over this stuff, and they say, well, just have the library buy everybody a code and manage them all. Yes. Um, how many students did you have, Virginia? <laughs> Two to four hundred. Yeah. And every term. <laughs> And then I wanted to start there for that. Yeah, and I was not even the only intro to site. No, there, there were about half a dozen coming up in next year's, I noticed, you know, for teaching intro to site in upcoming terms. But that is something, and we'll get into more of it later. And Tim's got some things to say on um, tutorials and that. But we trying to help people out with supplementary resources too, so. Just a kind of quick question. You put a note in earlier, and this is a question I get from faculty from time to time, is that the concept of reading in print versus reading electronically, and are they retaining? And that's been one of the concerns. Can you, 
do you want to expand on that anymore? Yeah, actually I've been in the process of working on a systematic review, looking at reading from print versus electronic sources, and generally what I'm finding is there's either no difference or it's a pretty small difference reading as far as the two um, ways of reading. Bottom line is they need to read. Like, in terms of student perception. And, well, in terms of student perception, students actually generally say they prefer, um, sorry, students generally say they prefer print. Uh, but if you give them a reading on a screen versus on paper, you don't see a huge difference in terms of learning outcomes. Now, different studies show different things, but some show no difference, some show a benefit of print, but uh, it's, it's not a huge other questions? I find this product is very interesting because you know like the, yeah, if you see the environmental part of it, this can save the world because you know like if you're not printing that many books and things like that. So definitely it's a very environmental friendly product. But, uh, That's definitely an advantage. <laughs> it is a very good advantage. But here's my question. You know, like since uh, this is all electronic versions and everything, so when the student with disabilities mm -hmm. accessing this uh, uh, books and everything, how do they prepare this thing? Is it quite accessible for the uh, student with disabilities, or they are going to have a little bit difficulties of opening these books? Um, my understanding is that at least for the open access library at the University of Minnesota where they have a collection of open source textbooks, it has to be something that's downloadable and ADA compliant. So it has to be something that can work with software intended to help students with disabilities. Uh, there, there have been a number of studies looking at vision impairments and you, there is a benefit with electronic because you can make it so much bigger, uh, but then there's the downsides that a lot of times people report that the glare is very tiring and you do see eye strain issues, so it's it's uh, it's definitely not harmful for somebody. And keep in mind, open access doesn't mean it has to be electronic, it's just that's how it's free, so they certainly can print it out or you know, get a bound copy and then if they're using magnifier or something like that, and that could be helpful. One last question. Um, back to the difference between students from detention reading print versus electronic. Um, you mentioned you're doing a systematic review. Have you encountered any differences in research between disciplines? The students use text differently. So like English majors, for example, do lots of annotation. And their textbooks are, are like usually book books rather than textbooks, which could be considered similar, like math textbooks are maybe similar to biology is similar to psych. That's a great point. That is actually something I'm coding for in a difference, but I haven't gone through in a systematic way to see if there's a content uh, effect so, so that drives the effect. I should add that one complaint students had was, well, I can't highlight in this, I can't write comments in this, I, I, I can't annotate, and you know, part of that is as an instructor or as, you know, become more savvy with ebooks is learning. No, actually, you can mark up an electronic book. You can make notes, and there are ways to use an electronic book in that way uh, to encourage more active learning. So. And there's different platforms they can put them on too. There's um, just to mention there's there's actually a service, and they were charging I think it was a hundred dollars per book to help ad adapt text for. Um, people with disabilities, so, and I know SOAP does some things in Hawaii, a lot of people. Um, does anybody have any last question for Virginia? If not, she's very nice, and I'm sure she will bite if you email her. So, okay. I actually just finished uh, writing up a draft manuscript of this work, so if yeah. you're interested in, in that copy, that's you know, it's not out, obviously, it hasn't been done study yet, but I do have it in writing. If to see it that way. Okay, thank you very much.